Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a model showcase video for this 135th scale M60 main battle tank. Now, unlike many of the other smaller scale builds that are seen on the ECA channel, where those builds are built for private commission and belong to a private collector, the model that we have here is built for my own personal collection and is not for sale and or purchase. However, like I often mention in these smaller scale videos, I frequently take on commission builds from models ranging between 135th scale and 16th scale. For availability and pricing information, this information would be best by contacting me through the email address listed below, which is info at eastcoastarmory.com. Now this model here is built predominantly out of the box and we'll be going over many of the kit's aspects as well as some areas to watch out for. In addition to that, we're also going to be taking this model and giving it a thorough in-box kit review. So stay tuned because there's a lot of info coming. Before we continue with the video, let's go ahead and take a quick walk around this model. Now I'm gonna start this by asking a question. Close your eyes and imagine what comes to mind when I say the word M60 main battle tank. If the vehicle that pops into your head has a nice needle nose shaped turret to it, congratulations, you've just picked the M60A1. And most people do, as when most people think of the M60, that's the tank that generally comes to mind. Or if you're really cool, you thought of the Starship, but generally, the A1 of the pattern is what you think of. However, if you ever wondered what the original M60 looks like, look no further, because that's the vehicle that we have right here. Now, the basis of the M60 has its roots in the 1950s. During this time, the US military developed the M48 series of patents. The M48 utilized lots of new technology, which separated from its earlier World War II counterparts. This thing would have had an all-cast bat-tub hull, as well as an all-cast turtle-back turret. And the suspension was more or less a product-improved variant, which was developed for the M26 Pershing. However, during the 1950s, there was some room for improvement that could have been made, specifically with the new Russian tanks which were being developed in the Soviet Union. Some of the aspects of the m 48 design which could have been improved, first and foremost was the tank's engine and power pack. Originally the M48 would have utilized a gasoline engine and this engine proved to be problematic for just maintenance reasons as well as suffering from limited range due to the fuel consumption of that thirsty V12 gas engine. Other problems which could have been perceived was the tank's armor protection. Although the armor protection was suffice for the early 1950s, it was deemed that towards the 1960s the tank was going to be behind its Soviet counterparts. Another aspect of the m 40 design which could have been improved was the tank's main armament. Originally the tank was armed with a 90mm gun and again at the time the M48 was developed, the 90mm was a good anti-tank weapon. However, again with the evolution of Soviet armor protection, the 90 was going to fall short. Now, throughout the M48 Patton's developmental run, a lot of these issues were corrected, namely the, the gas engine and the power plant issue. However, it was also deemed during the 1950s that it would be best to develop a brand new tank design that has many of these problems already corrected out of the get-go. And this new vehicle was to be named the M60. Building upon lessons that were learned during the M48's developmental run, the M60 out of the gate was going to utilize a diesel power plant. The turbo diesel, which was also being used on the new current versions of the M48 Patton, was far superior to the original Continental gas engine, which was found on the original Patton series. Also, which was developed further was the design of the hull. Rather than utilizing the frog nose bat tub style hull, the front portion was redesigned to have a more knife angle to it. With this new design of front, it was deemed to have better ballistic protection compared to the more blunter but curved surface found on the original M48. The vehicle was also to utilize a new turret which housed the larger British L7 105mm main gun. At this time, the L7 was adopted by NATO and was the standard tank gun for the Western Allies. The turret overall was very similar in shape and size to the one found on the M48, but the new turret featured 
thicker armor, as well as different internal space to house the new fire control systems which were being developed for this new tank. Another change was with the secondary armament. Rather than utilizing the M2HB for the Commander and an M37 for the coax gun, which was found on the M48, the M60 was to utilize the brand new M85 50 caliber machine gun and the M73 7.62 caliber machine gun for the coax. And in order to house the brand spanking new M85, the mini cupola was redesigned on the M60 where it had better panoramic view compared to the early versions found on the M48. This new vehicle was adopted for service in 1959 and went into full production. It started being fielded by US troops in the early 1960s. Now shortly after the adoption and feeling of the new vehicle, some shortcomings came to light, which is not uncommon for a newly developed vehicle. This would be the inclusion of a secondary set of shock absorbers for the suspension, but more importantly, the designers decided to revisit the shape of the turret. Rather than utilizing and keeping the, the round turtleback style M48 turret, the designers concluded that the tank would have better ballistic protection from the front if the turret was redesigned to have a more slender needle nose type profile to it. This new turret was adopted and vehicles equipped with this new turret were designated the M60A1. The M60A1 of course would go on and serve with the US military and be further upgraded throughout the rest of its developmental life into the 1990s. Now like I said before a large number of these original configuration M60s were created. A large number of these vehicles either were rebuilt as M60A1 configurations or many of them wound up being issued out to foreign countries in terms of military aid. An even larger number of these vehicles mostly stayed stateside and were eventually given to National Guard and reservist units. Finally, a large number of these vehicles were just outright decommissioned and a large number of them wound up in military museums or outside of military bases basically being used as gate guards, or on the same note, being utilized in VFW posts. And of course, regrettably, the ones that didn't end up with that type of fate generally wound up being used as hard targets on military shooting ranges, being used to test new weapons like Hellfire, Toe, and other type of anti-tank weapons. Now, oddly enough, even though the M60 was the main battle tank of the US military during the 1960s time frame, none of which were ever deployed or sent to Southeast Asia and Vietnam. The M60 itself basically either stayed stateside or was sent over to West Germany and was housed in the military bases in Western Europe. Now, although this version of the M60 is a short-lived one, it didn't really participate in any noteworthy conflicts in US military service, it is a very interesting vehicle as it's the separation point between the M48 Patton and the new M60 tank family. Before we go any further with the video, let's go ahead and take a step back to when the model was first started in order to get a good idea on what the base starter kit supplies you with. And here's the model at the start of the build. For the base starter kit, I'll be utilizing this 135th scale Dragon M60 Patton kit. Now this was one build and kit release that I was really, really looking forward to, as this version of the M60 was one that eluded many of the large scale plastic model companies for many, many decades. Dragon, in recent years, went ahead and dove into the world of the Patton series, starting with their M48 A3s, eventually rounding off doing the A1, and here you can see they went ahead and turned their attention to the next level up, which of course is the M60. These kits here were released by Dragon back in 2016, so they are a relatively recent release. This particular one here I acquired off of eBay about a year or a year and a half ago, so it has just a little bit of shelf dust on the box. Wiping off the rest of the dust takes us to, of course, the box art. Here we have the M60 Patton in a West German field, probably during some kind of military exercise. Just like with most of the Dragon box arts, it's illustrated by Ronald Volstead. And the box art is typical of his quality, which is very nicely done. The rendering on the Volstead pieces are one of the better ones in the industry at the moment. The tank itself is nicely rendered. 
with all of its detailing. Note on the row wheels and even on the track. And the scene is nice and peaceful. We have some basic graphic design, the Dragon logo. And this model here is actually not part of their Black Label series, which is a series which has been getting some scorn in recent years due to the mishaps that Dragon has incorporated on several of their kits. This one here, rather, is part of their modern AFE series, which is actually one of Dragon's oldest series sets and dates back all the way to the early 1990s when Dragon first emerged. Continuing with the features, here we have a color palette. Some corporate info. And of course some CAD drawings showing the kit's features. On the back, we have some other CAD drawings. And it's just basic, basically used as advertisement for the kit. Opening up the box will reveal the kit contents. Now this kit here, being a smart kit, does feature several components comprised of different materials compared to your standard injection molded opaque plastic. These would include parts made in clear, brass photo etch, as well as rubber, which we'll be going over once I dig into the contents. Also on a similar note, since this kit here is a recent Dragon release, you are going to have the type of detail fidelity and plastic moldings which one would find on the other contemporary recent released Dragon kits. Such kits that come to mind would be the M48 Patton's, the Conqueror, as well as also the M60A2 Starship. In fact, many of the runners found in this box here are borrowed from some of those kits that I mentioned. Not so much the Conqueror, but definitely the 48 and the Starship. First runner takes us to the lower hull. Now, of course, being an M60, it has the pike nose. Now, one thing that's really nice to point out is the fidelity found on the lower hull details. This kit does have some nice, finely molded cast texturing as the other underhull details. I believe this runner here was the same one utilized on the M68-2 Starship that I built a little while ago. One thing I like about the Dragon Kit was that they really did a nice job with the asymmetrical aspect of the lower hull. Because of the way the M60 suspension is laid out, the suspension is actually slightly shifted due to the torsion bar layout. Very similar to what's done on German tanks, or World War II tanks for that matter. But on the 60, you definitely have this asymmetrical pattern play out right here on the first suspension swing arm axle. This is something that's not really done on the older kits from like Tamiya or Academy, but it's definitely one that was done by Dragon. You can also see the little blistered hump over here near the escape hatch. Again, very nice touch. And moving towards the upper hull, we have all of the other details, or I should say the provisions for mounting the details that are all present. On the other side of the bag, we have here the suspension runner. Now, they look very similar in size and shape compared to the M48 Patton series, and which were also the same ones supplied with the Dragon M103 series. But of course, this one here being for an M60, the runners are a little bit different. And the difference, of course, is being the actual pattern of the row wheel. This kit here does have the M60's pattern of aluminum row wheels, which are iconic by having those little support ribs found along the edges. Note, the detail on the inner rim is also very nicely done as well. The way the tires break down with the rim is very similar, if not identical, to the m 48 Or I should say the way Dragon executed the M48 kit, which do build up very nicely. And here we have the actual swing arm mounts. Note the detailing and the shape and geometry of the components, very realistic and very closely mirroring that of the real unit. First runner takes us to the lower hull. Now, of course, being an M60, it has the pike nose. Now, one thing that's really nice to point out is the fidelity found on the lower hull details. This kit does have some nice, finely molded cast texturing, as 
as well as the other underhull details. I believe this runner here was the same one utilized on the M68 II Starship that I built a little while ago. One thing I like about the Dragon Kit was that they really did a nice job with the asymmetrical aspect of the lower hull. Because of the way the M60 suspension is laid out, the suspension is actually slightly shifted due to the torsion bar layout. Very similar to what's done on German tanks, or World War II tanks for that matter. But on the 60, you definitely have this asymmetrical pattern play out right here on the first suspension swing arm axle. This is something that's not really done on the older kits from like Tamiya or Academy, but it's definitely one that was done by Dragon. You can also see the little blister hump over here near the escape hatch. Again, very nice touch. And moving towards the upper hull, we have all of the other details, or I should say the provisions for mounting the details that are all present. On the other side of the bag, we have here the suspension runner. Now, they look very similar in size and shape compared to the M48 Patton series, and which were also the same ones supplied with the Dragon M103 series. But of course, this one here being for an M60, the runners are a little bit different. And the difference, of course, is being the actual pattern of the row wheel. This kit here does have the M60's pattern of aluminum row wheels which are iconic by having those little support ribs found along the edges. Note, the detail on the inner rim is also very nicely done as well. And here we have the actual swing arm mounts. Note the detailing and the shape and geometry of the components, very realistic and very closely mirroring that of the real unit. From the row wheels brings us to this beige rubbery piece. This of course contains the components for the mantlet and the mantlet sleeve. Now I may or may not be mistaken, but I believe this piece is a recycled component from the Dragon M48A3 kits that came out a little while ago. However, I'm not 100% certain as I haven't really built any of the Dragon M48A3s yet. So, if anyone does know, however, feel free to mention that in the comment section listed below. Moving to the next runner brings us to, of course, the turret. And the turret here is basically the most important aspect of this entire kit, as really this is what makes this kit different from all the other M60 patent kits on the market. This features the early pattern of turtle style turret for the M60, and of course it's different from the M48 with the shape of the rear bustle, which I'll go over in more detail as the video progresses. But the quality on the turret is very nicely detailed. We have some nice fine cast texturing presence, along with the other smaller provisions found on the turret for its many amenities, from the tarpaulin mounts all the way up to the tow cable mounts. On the same runner we have the turret mini cupola. Again, same type of quality in the detailing, as well as the other turret components, which do look very nicely molded. Also included looks to be a few other runners, which were lifted from the M48 series, which include probably a lot of crossover parts like small little handles and other little provisions, which I'm pretty sure are the same on the M60 as well. On this runner here, we have the side skirts, or I should say the fenders for the Patton, and it also has the Xenon searchlight. And I'm confident that a lot of these parts here are probably not going to be recycled on this kit, and more likely this kit's going to have a plethora of spare parts, just like what was found on many of the other Dragon Patton series of vehicles. But again, more pro on that is to come. Taking us to the last parts bag. First brings us to a fret of clear plastic components, which is used on several of their other patent kits. You can see some parts from the M48A3, like the cupola riser extender, as well as the lens here for the Xenon searchlight, and the little optics that go on the sides of the patent's turret. More likely what's relevant on this runner are going to be the periscope inserts, for the versions on the hull, as well as the bow headlights, and of course the Xenon searchlight if used on this kit. Other runners 
include the bottom portion of the M48 turret, which I believe is recycled for this kit. This kit has the option of being made with the mantlet with the tarpaulin cover off, which is a nice touch. And again, a few other pieces obviously are not going to be used like the M48 pattern of cupola. The other runners include some more fittings such as the engine grill and the rear engine deck. And again, another fret here of extended fenders. It's gonna be interesting to see exactly how the kit gets cobbled together with all these components here. The last kit supply parts to mention are the tank's tracks. And this kit here features the single piece vinyl tracks, which are made in the Dragon Flexible DS styrene, which is a fantastic medium for this application and has been used on several of the other Dragon kits in the past. I've had some really good results with this type of media and they do hold up very well in my opinion. The tracks are very nicely detailed with both their inside and outside details. They are on par, if not better, than the tracks found with the Tamiya kits. And these pieces here are the exact same ones, which were, are unsurprisingly lifted again from their M48 patent series, and are also, I believe, the same ones featured on their M60A2 Starship. I gotta say, I really do like that Dragon went with this track method because that saves me a whole heap and load of time trying to find tracks that are workable as a replacement for the stock kit ones. Obviously, with this pattern of track, that's not going to be needed for this kit. Digging deeper into the box takes us to the instruction manual. And just like I hinted to before, this kit is going to have a whole heap and load of parts that are not going to be utilized on this kit and are going to be relegated to the spare parts bin. The instructions look to be straightforward and are on par with the other Dragon CAD type drawings that are utilized on their kits. And of course, if there's anything awry with the instructions, I'll gladly point them out in the latter half of the video where the tank is already built and painted. Taking this to the bottom is the decal sheet. Typical water slide decals. There's also a small fret of photo etch and a little length of steel wire cable. Starting with the model suspension running gear, all the components that you see here are kit supplied from Dragon and were assembled out of the box. On the road wheels, one thing to point out is like what was showcased before in the unboxing portion, the rim is separate from the tire, which is actually a really nice design choice. The advantage with going with this design is that this allows you to paint the two pieces separately and then mount them together prior to final installation, much in the same way that is done on a real vehicle. With the other design where you have the tire integrally molded or casted into the rim, you have to painstakingly go in here with a paintbrush and paint each and every little rim and the tire surface and even the backs. It's doable, of course, but it is something that does take a little bit of time. With this design, that's not really the case. It speeds it up and makes things a little bit easier. However, one thing to watch out for is that because you have all of these separate rubber tires that are loose and running around, you can easily misplace and lose one. And if you do, you're really in for trouble because Dragon only gives you enough to equip the number of road wheels that are supplied on this model. In fact, I have to say this warning because that's exactly what happened to me. During the construction, one of the tires during the painting phase must have been misplaced and wound up in Lost Partia. Because of which, I was really up the creek without a paddle if it wasn't for the fact that I built the Dragon M103 kits in the past. The reason why the M103 kit was able to save me was that if anyone has built the Dragon M103s, and probably have complained about the accuracies, you'll know that the way the layout of the parts are design is that the Dragon M13 borrows many of the runners from the Dragon M48 series and because of that you are going to have leftover tires and rims. Luckily on the Dragon M48 kit the rim and the tire are two separate moldings just like they are here on the M60. Although even though the pieces are very similar to each other the tires are not an exact swap for the versions on the M60 and some slight modifications need to be made to that tire in order to get it to fit on the M60 rim. 
Luckily, this was easily done, and once completed, the look is absolutely seamless. So seamless, in fact, that I'm not going to say which one of these wheels was the culprit at hand, and I'll just let the viewers try to find it for themselves. Now from the wheels takes us to the sprocket. Now the sprockets on this model here are just like the ones that were utilized on the other Dragon M48 and the other Patton series of kits. And just like with many of the other plastic model kits on the market, Dragon went ahead and molded this section of the sprocket where, with solid walls. Now this isn't necessarily an inaccuracy because several of the subcontractors that the US government used to make these sprocket hubs for the M60, several did not include the mud slits and it's this type of pattern is seen floating around on several M60s that are still around today. However, for this model here, I always like adding the mud slits because it adds a nice little bit of detailing that is absent on the kit. And this was done with a Dremel. However, when it comes to adding these mud slits, this is something that should only be done by a very experienced modeler who has the correct tools to do this because you can easily screw it up. And if you do, you're basically going to be out trying to scrounge a runner of these parts that we have here. Now, when it comes to the mud slits, there are three found on the M60 sprocket. We have one, two, and three. If you're going to do this conversion and you have the tools and the skills at hand, luckily finding a close-up picture of one of these sprockets is very easily done with a simple Google search. From the sprockets now takes us to the track. Now the track on this model here is very reminiscent to the track utilized on the Tamiya kits. It's single piece, flexible vinyl type, but for the Dragon kits they utilize their DS styrene, which is a very nice medium and is one that I like to see on their kits. Now for the paintwork, just like what is mentioned on many of my American tank builds, the, M the M60 and just like all the other American tanks utilize a hybrid steel and rubber type system for their composition. You have rubber faces on the exterior where the chevrons are. You have steel utilized for the end connectors, the center connector, which is also the, the guide horn. On the inside, you have here a set of rubber pads that the row wheels run on, and then on the ends, it's just left with its steel material. Now, for weathering these tracks, like the way you see it here is basically how these tracks would weather in real life. A lot of individuals, when they weather these tracks, they just paint the whole thing in rust color and call it a day, or they paint it all rust and only leave the chevrons left in their rubber coloring. Obviously, this is less than realistic. If you just go with this type of format here, your tracks will definitely look better and will severely bump up the look of your overall build. Now from the tracks in the running gear brings us to the upper and lower hull assemblies. Now on this model here the hull components are very nicely done. There is some really good cast texturing, the detail work is also very much appreciated, and the way everything fits together does fit together in a very smooth and mostly problem free format. However, I will point this out for anyone who's interested in getting one of these you are going to have to do some seam removal work on these sections over here. This is unavoidable with any sort of patent family vehicle in plastic kit form. This is true for not just this M60, but the M103s, the M48s, and also I'm going to throw in there the same type of vehicles from Tamiya, Academy, and hell, even Monogram for that matter. With the way these vehicles have that complex bathtub shaped hull, you're going to have a lot of sub-assemblies in order to assemble. Now, on this model here, they do assemble in a very quick and mostly effortless format. You do have to take your time with it though because of the way the mosaic assembles. If you're rushing and you're not letting the glues dry, you're gonna have something shift on you, which is gonna have some problems with the fitting of the engine deck or the top deck or some other thing along the way. And you just want to avoid that as much as possible. So take your time. Let the glues dry, make sure they set, and you should be pretty much good to go. Once those glues set, you are going to have some seams. And the seams basically run on this leading edge over here where the upper curve meets the lower curve, the front of the hull, the back here of the engine grills, as well as some areas here of the side work that is beneath the tin work and these boxes here on the top deck. 
Now, the seam work is, again, pretty much sub is standard, the type of removal techniques that you'll use to get rid of them on most plastic models. Putties, sandpaper, thick CA, anything along those lines will remove the, the seam work. Now, one thing that I did on this model here was that after the seam work was done, I re-added the cast texturing that was removed from the seam removal process. I'm not sure if it could pop up here on camera, but if you see the model in person, you'll be able to see what I'm referring to. Now, in addition to removing of the seams, anyone who has an avid eye for these patent lower hulls will notice that there are some features missing on this lower hull here. And that is not done by accident, in fact, is requested to be done by Dragon. On the later versions of the, M of the M60 family, like the M60A1, A2, and A3, they went ahead and added some more hooks and grab points on these sections here of the lower hull. Now, on this model here, they are not utilized because this version of the M60 did not get those later additions. Because of that, you are going to have some areas to polish and remove. Namely, the small little holes that are found on the side here where the pieces plug into, you're going to have to delete and polish away. And on the back here, right where the final drive is, there is a small little slit that a large hook plugs into. The Dragon Kid wants you to glue the, the hook in and then just simply cut the hook off and polish it away with some sandpaper. On the model here, I just basically did the same thing where I used styrene as a filler. Regardless, you need to do that in order to plug it up. This was, of course, done because Dragon recycled their M60 lower hull from their A2 and the other versions of the M60 that they're undoubtedly going to release down the road. It's just them recycling in another mold, and it's one less thing they need to tool up. But it is something that the builder does have to keep in mind when he's building one of these kits, because you can easily get into a groove. Specifically, if you've done more than one of these patent tanks before, you're just going to start gluing all these hooks on, and next thing you know, you're going to have a mistake on your hands. While on the back, you can see some of the rear detailing. Everything here is built stock. One thing I want to point out is a common mistake I see on people's builds is with the painting of the taillights. The taillights on these American tanks is that you have a red light on the top, a silver light on the bottom, and on the version here on the right hand side, it's actually a blackout light. And when it's blacked out, you only have a small little section that the silver paint goes in, it's not red, and the bottom one is just again a silver stripe in that section there. By doing this, this is a one of those simple things that you just add to your model and the, and the end result is much more noticeable. From the rear area now takes us to the tin work. Now the tin work on this model is just like the other Dragon renditions of the Patton, where they are separate pieces that get glued to the center hull, which is a very nice feature and makes for a nice realistic model. Now the tin work may need some slight hand fitting. This all depends on how the rest of the mosaic assembly went. On this model here, there was some slight hand fitting required, namely here on the back area where the engine deck lies, but this is something that was very easily done and once made, the pieces just went in where they had to go. But again, this is another one of those locations where you're gonna need to let the glues fully set before you can progress and carry on. While on the back, I also wanna stress this is equally as important with the engine grills. You don't wanna screw this up because if you do, you're basically screwed. So again, caution needs to be exhibited by the builder during that phase. Moving to the front of the hull, we have here the two rubber fenders, as well as the bow headlights. Now, the headlights are molded in clear plastic, just like the other patent renditions made by Dragon, and make for a nice, realistic assembly. And I always like it when companies use clear plastic parts for these pieces. Here you can see the fire extinguisher detailing. Note it's painted in red, which was done on vehicles during this time frame. And the clear plastic runners were also utilized on the three front periscopes. Moving from there takes us to the bow hatch. The hatch on this model is lifted from the Dragon M48 kit, and I believe that would be the type of hatch found on this very early rendition of the M60. Later versions utilize a different periscope that we have here, and the shape has more of a angled slope on the front periscope section. 
Now on this kit here, the hatch is only designed to be mounted in the closed state. It's not like the Tamiya models where you can actually have the hatch function and slide out of the way. So if you're looking to modify this model by giving it some kind of interior detailing or if you want to have a driver have his head poking out, you are going to have to do some tweaks and scratch building to this kit in order to get that effect. However, if you're just building the tank like I am as just a static exterior model only, then the hatch is just a simple installation. While on the tin work, we can see the angled supports and note they have their perforations in them. And this is probably my favorite part about these Dragon patents and what really makes them far better than the earlier tooling found on the Tamiya and even the Academy releases. On another video, I remember having a discourse with an individual who claimed that the Academy model was better detailed than the Dragon counterpart, to which I respectfully disagree. Look no further than with these pieces here on the sides. On the Dragon model, these are separate pieces that need to be glued onto the tin work, while on the Academy counterpart, it is directly from the old 1970s Tamiya release of the m 60 a one where these pieces are solid, they're a little bit flatter because they're molded into the tin work. This portion alone makes the Dragon rendition of the M60 far superior in my opinion. Now is this something that can be fixed and addressed on the Tamiya and the Academy? Absolutely, there are photo wedge sets available, but you need to now purchase more things to add to your quote unquote more affordable kit compared to the ones that come out of the box. Same can also be said about the bow headlights. Not necessarily the headlights themselves, even though they are still better than the Academy ones, but the brush guards. If you look at the brush guards on the Dragon one, they are their correct shape by being a piece of angle material that is bent to the cover the bow headlight, but they also have their correct support brace, and that brace even has the locking nub and fastener integrally molded in. This is all simplified on the Academy and Tamiya tooling and is again something that would need to be acquired as an aftermarket source and you're now dealing with photo etch which a lot of people don't have the experience with working with. So right, so again, the Dragon is a leg up above the Academy counterpart. On the upper deck now takes us to the fuel filler cap. Now another difference is that on this early version of the M60 there is only one fuel filler cap found on the upper hull. As opposed to the other later versions of the M60 where there would have been two, one found on each of the corner sides here of the rear hull. On the early version of the M60 that's not the case. Note for the weathering I went ahead and made the piece to have some overflow to it which is something which is typically seen on large heavy equipment and military vehicles in general. Now from the hull brings us to the turret which is basically the heart and soul of this entire tank and what differentiates it from the M60A1 which we all know and love. Now before I do, one modification that I had to make to the turret was not necessarily to the turret but was with the hull tin work themselves. On the Dragon M60 series of kits, I'm not sure if this is true for the M48s, and I know, I don't remember it being an issue on the M103s, but on the M60s, once the tin work gets fitted to the hull, there are two round sections that complete the tin work, and they stick proud over the turret bearing. Because of that, the turret is going to be a very tight and snug fit when it comes time for mounting. And this can lead to issues where if you want to turn the turret, it's going to be so stiff you're, you can possibly run the risk of breaking parts. So if I take the turret off, you'll see how this was addressed. With the turret removed, you can see the two rounded sections I was referring to, here and here. These are the two areas which were in question that stood above the deck and because of that were inhibiting the turret from moving. To fix this issue with a Dremel, I was able to basically just mill away the extra material required and once done, the turret dropped directly into place and note, notice how smooth and effortless the turret can rotate now. Now as for the turret itself, what you see is what was supplied out of the box. The turret went together without any problems. It is very nicely detailed. 
Now the kit does give you an option to either have the vehicle tarpaulinless, where you have the actual mantlet underneath, or like you see on this way with the tarpaulin. For this model here, I wanted to go with the tarpaulin because it's just an iconic bit of equipment found on these patented M60 vehicles. But if I ever get another one, I would definitely go with the old school and leave it with the tarpaulin off. Another piece of option that the kit gives you is the ability to add the searchlight. Now, the searchlight is the ones which are found on the other Dragon M48 and M60 kits, which I have discussed in more depth in other videos, and the piece is very nicely detailed, being a little bit tricky to assemble and assemble without the seams, but it is it does make for a very nicely done bit of piece. But on this model here, I was actually originally going to mount it on, but I had some problems with the mounting surface. You see, the tarpaulin and also the tarpaulin plugs here for the for the actual searchlight are made from the flexible DS styrene. Now, DS styrene is a nice choice. It gives you a little bit of flexibility, and it does have some very nice detailing found on it. The problem is it's not a very strong and secure mounting point for the searchlight. If you try to mount it on, it's going to have some weird yawing to it from what I've found, and so it's really best to leave the, the searchlight off. If you are going to put a searchlight on, make the rendition without the tarpaulin in place, or if you are going to do the searchlight, you might want to replace these small little searchlight mounts here with possibly something made in just standard plastic, because these flexible little nubs are just not really the best for mounting something that's a little bit heavy like that searchlight. From the tarpaulin takes to the main 105 millimeter gun. This is stock with the kit and the piece is just nicely engineered. Not really much to talk about there. Moving on back takes to the grab handles. Now this is something that's always a little bit difficult on these patent based vehicle and this kit here is no different. However, I will say that the pieces are very finely molded and made. And because of this you want to exhibit a lot of caution when it comes time for removal and mounting these to the vehicle. So much so that you might want to make sure that your blades are nice and sharp so you can properly remove these without causing any problems. I will also add that the securing to the model is also going to be something you want to take your time with and probably use a nice set of pliers just to carefully prop them on where they need to go. Moving along, the turret takes to the blower. Now this is another one of those parts which it might be a little surprising, but does take a little bit of caution to assemble. It's comprised of three parts. We have here the bottom tray, the filter top, and the searchlight mounts. The purpose of the, these parts over here is that when the searchlight is not in use, you can mount it vertically in the storage mode. Now, for the bottom tray, when it gets mounted to the turret, you are going to have a seam to contend with. Now, why this is important is that on this turret here, it does have some cast texturing molded in, and the whole unit would be cast on the real counterpart. So you want to be able to carefully remove the seam, but still have some texturing there so that it blends in thoroughly with the rest of the turret. It's doable, but it's something you, you need to have a little finesse with. The rest of the, the, the top portion here, that's simple enough, it just drops on in place like it would on a Tamiya. Now on this guy over here, this is where you want to be careful because you can easily break the pieces off of the sprue and possibly break them during the installation. So you want to be very careful with this section over here. From the air blower, takes to the jerry can, stock unit. Just I want to point out the way it's painted. We have the olive drab for the can, and the strap is this olive green color. And notice I went ahead and painted the buckle with a little drop of black paint. It really helps make the piece pop. Now, things like retention straps would have these colors on vehicles during this time frame. Now, moving to the back, takes it to the gypsy rack, and this is one portion of these patent series of tanks that is always tricky and this kit here is no exception but on this kit here it's actually amplified because the parts are extremely finely molded and on top of that the instructions are shall we say less than desirable <laughs> for this one piece right here starting with the pieces like I said before they are very finely molded so the sharp tools are, and patience are going to be needed on this yet again. Now, when it comes time for the assembly, I believe the instructions actually have it inverted. So, or there's some kind of optical illusion going on with the way the CAD drawings are, because if you try to follow the instructions, you're, 
you're gonna have a bad time. So you wanna take your time, you wanna dry fit pieces on, see how things go, and then finally commit to the assembly and the install. Once you get through that, you're basically good to go. I will say that once fitted to the model, the rack does fit on nicely and there's no problems like some of the mounting pegs sticking up or having a gap in between them. I didn't really run into that on this model. It's just the basic assembly of the pieces where you really wanna be careful. From the gypsy rack now takes to the tow cables. Now this is one aspect of this build that I did run into a problem. Now the tow cables are designed where we have plastic and connectors and then a medium which acts as the cable. Um, this type of feature is found on several other kits, but unlike kits from Tamiya or Academy where you get a length of nylon for the tow cable, on the Dragon Kit it actually gives you a length of real metal cable, which is a very nice touch. And this cable was the same type of cable that's been offered on several other of their builds, and I've had some really good luck with them in the past. The problem is on this model here, they didn't give me enough. I literally only had enough cable to assemble one of these tow cables and on the M60 there are two and you are supposed to fit two to this rear section here of the turret, just like an M48. Now, the it's not like I made any mistakes with the cable. I double checked and triple checked when I was building it. The length of the cable is only about this much longer than the actual section itself and I only received one of them. I'm not sure if this was a mistake with my kit or if this is something that is a pressing issue on other Dragon M60s, but it's something to keep in mind if you are either gonna buy one of these or if you have one of these in your stash, you might wanna check that. Now, one of the cables of course was used and for the other one, I had to find a cable that matched the original one perfectly. Luckily for me, I, I didn't have to look too far because I had a spare cable on hand from another Dragon build that I did a little while back that I didn't utilize the metal cable on. Because of that build and because of my spare parts bin, I was able to complete this model here with Dragon parts. But again, this is something you definitely want to pay attention to on your kit in your stash. And this was probably by and large the biggest problem I had with the whole kit. Now moving from the tow cables brings us to a very unique bit of equipment found on the very early versions of the M60 that a lot of people don't realize and that is the ability to mount an external M2HB heavy machine gun. Now if we look here on the rear bustle of the M60 you'll see a or what appears to be a pintle mount and one that looks very similar to the ones found on the top of the Sherman's turret. Well, this is a pinnel mount, and this is actually for the storage mode. Just like what was seen on the rear of the Sherman tank and even the M26 Pershing, when the machine gun wasn't in use, it would be fitted to the back portion over here where it would be strapped in place with its cradle. And to do that, you would need some kind of a pinnel system, and that's what was designed on the original M60. Now, the Dragon Kit does have the pinnel mount. It is nicely detailed, and they even rendered it with the little rubber cap, which would have been found on the top to prevent water from pooling up on the inside. On the model here, I just simply installed it out of box and I just painted the top portion again to replicate rubber. Now, if you're modeling this piece and you don't wanna have the rubber cap in place, you simply just file it away and with a pin vise, you could drill it out, giving you a little bit extra detailing. From the storage gun mount now takes us to the antenna base. Now the antenna base is the kit supplied unit but was slightly modified from the kit original. As we can recall the kit original has its antenna and its antenna base integrally molded as one piece. Now this is always something that is a very problematic feature found on tank model kits. Plastic antennas break all the time and if you're going to build this model I strongly recommend chopping it off because it'll lead to nothing but problems. Now, on this model here, after the piece was deleted, I went ahead and drilled out the antenna base with a pin vise and a very small bit, and I was able to replace the antenna with a piece of metal wire. Metal wire is a lot better because it's flexible and it won't snap on you, it'll just bend if nudged or bumped into. The metal wire is always a superior way to go, and I recommend it for anyone who's building plastic models. The only caveat again is if you don't have a Dremel bit or a pin vise, don't undertake this procedure because you can easily screw up the spring antenna base and if it's ruined, you're gonna have to try to track something else down. Now there are aftermarket sources out there, but 
if you don't have the tools required, just simply cut the antenna off and just leave the vehicle without its antenna fitted. These antennas just screw directly into the base, so it's not uncommon to see the vehicle with the piece removed for one reason or another. From there, now it takes us to the loader's hatch. Overall, nicely done. Good detailing on it. The springs, if you notice, are they stick above the hatch, which makes it a lot more detailed and better accuracy compared to the older generation of Tamiya and Academy kits. And moving forward takes us to the plug here mount for the searchlight. Obviously, with the searchlight not, not installed, you would leave the piece as is. If you are going to install the searchlight, you would need to remove this small little section, drill it out, and this is where the power cord would plug into. From there, now it takes to the front gunner scope. This is made out of clear plastic and is a nice feature done by Dragon. Finally, this takes us to the tank's commander's cupola slash mini turret. Now, this is a very nice bit of detailing, and Dragon did go ahead and model the correct one for this version of the M60. Why I say that has to do with this small little plate that we have here. If you notice, this plate has small little holes in it. And these four holes look very similar to the mounting holes for a 50 caliber pintel mount, like the ones on the Sherman. And there's a reason for that because that's exactly what this would have been used for. Just like what I said before, you had this small gun mount here in the back for the storage mode, but when the unit was to actually be fired, it would mount to this little plate. Now what's really cool is that this plate, if you notice, is on an angle here of the turret. So you can't just have the gun mount just sticking up straight. So instead, the gun mount actually had a gooseneck to it. It would secure to this plate here with four bolts, it would emerge like this, and then it would bend upward and leave for a nice flat surface in order to mount the M2 HB 50 caliber to. Now, this feature, I don't believe was actually ever incorporated, but was something that was found on several of the early production units of the M60. And it was just realistically nothing more than an appendix. Several of the units still had these pieces still present, like you see here, but I believe later versions and later castings of the M60 would have just replaced all these pieces altogether. But it's a nice feature that Dragon incorporated it on this build. So if you're running into this build and you're trying to wonder what the hell are these pieces for, there you go. Now you know. On the mini cupola, we also have the three little lift rings, which are found on these three sections, which again is another detailed improvement over the legacy kits that I mentioned before. Now these pieces are extremely fragile and frail and it wouldn't be unsurprising if you accidentally break or lose one during the course of assembly. If you do, it's not a total loss. These things are extremely easy to fabricate out of a piece of floor wire and a small pair of pliers. But if you are gonna have to fabricate it, I would recommend with a pin vise drilling these sections out so the pieces plug into the mini cupola. Oddly enough, on the model here, that wasn't the case. The ones you see are the kit supplied ones. I guess the planets just lined up and I lucked out. This small little fitting also gets added to the model. Again, nice detailing all around. Now, the Mini Cupola does have some photo etch that does need to get added. That is kit supplied. Now, the PE is very simple. It's not like anything you have to bend or need any special skills for. One of the pieces that are photo etched is this little guy we have here, which is the pivot pin for the machine gun. And I believe there's another small little piece. Oh yeah, I believe these small little rivets here, these retention fasteners are actually made from photo etch. So very frail, but not impossible to mount on. While on the cupola it takes to the M85 50 caliber machine gun. Now the M60, I believe was the first main battle tank to actually enter service with this new 50 caliber gun, as well as also the new M73 7.62 millimeter coax gun. And both of these guns were basically crap. <laughs> if you talk to any tanker who served during this time frame, they will have nothing but negative opinions on either of these weapon systems. Which is probably why the designers knew this and incorporated a hard mount for a 50 caliber M2HB mod deuce because they probably knew the problems and shortcomings of the M85 but now I'm just being a smart ass. The, in all fairness, the only positive attribute that this gun has was basically its aesthetics. It has a really cool flash suppressor on the front and it's very distinctive. You see that flash suppressor on an AAV7 or an M60A3 and you know instantly what it is. Now the piece on the 
on the Dragon Kit here is exquisitely rendered. We have here the barrel curling shroud with its ventilation holes, and on the front here we have the flash suppressor, which has its correct conical shape, as well as its lightning insert cuts, and even the barrel is pre-drilled out, which on something this small is definitely a nice feature that the kit does give you. From there, this now brings us to the paint and the markings. For the overall base coat of the model, I went with the dark pattern of olive drab, which was found on US military vehicles from the post-Korean War timeframe all the way up through the mid 1970s when you started seeing vehicles get camouflage patterns like the Master and eventually the Merc and NATO. Now for the markings, these were the kit's applied decals and the kit does give you an option to build the vehicle in a couple different ways. Basically the Stars themselves stay the same, it's just the numbers on the turret that are different. Now, the marking quality is nicely done, no different than any of the other Dragon models that I've reviewed in the past. Their water slide decals, they go on without any problems, lacquer on, and just adhere very well. Overall, the decals were a very problem-free affair. Now, anyone who is an avid tank fan will tell you that the M60 is the clear evolutionary upgrade from the previous M48 Patton family. To put things in perspective, here I have an M48A1 Patton. Now, this kit here was another Dragon release, and this model is a subject matter of another model showcase video that is found on the ECA channel. And with the camera now closer in, you can see how the two tank designs basically evolve from each other. Now, keep in mind, the M48A1 in this configuration would have dated back to 1952 time frame, and the M60 in this configuration would have been from the early to mid 1960s. However, having said that, you can see how the designers used this as a starting point and developed it further into the vehicle that we have here. Both would have utilized the all single cast bat tub hull, however on the M48 where everything is more curved, sloped, and rounded, on the M60, it comes to this knife blade front that we have here. As opposed to the frog nose found on the M48. However, if you look at the underhull though, you'll notice that the bat tub shape was carried over as it was deemed to still have some very good valid ballistic protection. The axis hatches, of course, have changed quite a bit compared to the two vehicles. Some attributes of the two vehicles were interchangeable, like, for instance, the suspension. Both the M60 and the M48 Patton series utilize the same type of track design, as well as also a very similar road wheel design. One of the changes made to the M60, though, was with the wheel composition. On the M48 Patton, the wheels were made from steel stampings, while on the M60, to reduce weight, they were made from an aluminum alloy casting. Even though the M60 did utilize the aluminum pattern wheel, there were still a lot of the old stamped wheels still in the US inventory, and it's not uncommon to see M60s all the way up until the M60A1 and even to the M60A3 generation, where you'll still see some running around with the original M48 stamp pattern wheel. The vehicle sprockets were also interchangeable between the two vehicles. However, where things were different were with the power pack. Now, on the M48A1, this was the way the vehicle was originally envisioned with the use of a gas engine. As the patent improved, the gas engine was replaced with a diesel power pack, and with that, the rear of the tank over here changed dramatically. The M60 was designed to utilize the diesel from the get-go and stayed with it all the way to the end of its US military service life. What's also interesting to point out that the later versions of the M48, like the M48A2 and A3, and even the A5, had a rear assembly which was very similar to the rear section here of the M60. And the obvious connection that this vehicle has with the older M48 is the design of the turret. Both of the vehicles utilize the all single cast turtle back design, and you can see how the design basically morphed into the version which was utilized on the M60. Now, of course, some differences is the M60's dimensions are slightly different in that the armor protection is greater than in some spots here on the patent. And of course, the M60 was designed from the get-go to utilize the 105 millimeter gun, while the M48 was intended to use the 90. 
However, although the two turret designs are very similar, the big difference is not here with the front, but it's with the back. If I rotate these guys over, you can see exactly how the rear shapes of the turret are different. And here we have the rear portion of the M48. Note the curvature in this section over here. It's just a constant straight curve all the way down to the bottom. And in comparison to the original M60, you can see how the back has almost like a Sherman style rear bustle to its shape. And here you can also see the difference between the mini cupola on the M48 compared to the mini turret cupola found on the M60. Of course, the M48 would have utilized the standard M2HB 50 caliber machine gun, and the M60 used the M85. Arguably, one could say that this was a step backward compared to the older pattern that we have here. In the end, I am really happy on how this build turned out. This is one of those models that I've been wanting to see in a plastic kit form now for many, many, many decades. And yet, for some reason, it saluted the major manufacturers. The fact that Dragon stepped up to the plate and offered not only this version of the M60, but one with this level of quality in it is a really good slam dunk in my opinion. To get an idea on how difficult getting this model was, and to put things into perspective, before the release of this kit, if you wanted to build this version of the M60, you really had three options at hand. Option number one was to track down the old 130th scale in the Chimo M60 patent kit. Now, although this sounds like a viable option, you have to keep in mind that these Nichima 130 kits are extremely rare, and when found, you're going to be paying a bit of a premium for them. On top of that, the kit's quality is not exactly up to current specs with the type of tooling that one might expect, as these kits are dating from the late 60s into the early 70s, and their tooling does show it. These models are really more or less meant to be motorized toys as opposed to a finely detailed representation of the M60 tank. Another hurdle that these older kits have are their scale. Nichima went with an off scale being 1 30th, which means that the model is larger compared to the other 1 35th scale tanks in your collection. This specifically becomes problematic if you're intending this model for diorama use. Outside of that older kit, the other two options would have been either to kit bash one of these vehicles together with using a Tamiya or an Academy M60A1 as a donor and trying to cobble together your own turret either from scratch or possibly modifying a M48 turret to the M60 specs. Or for the longest time your only other option would have been the Legends conversion set again for the Tamiya or Academy M60A1. The Legends M60 conversion set supplies you with an all cast resin turret and mantlet, as well as a few other cast resin and photo etch bits and pieces in order to fully convert the Tamiya or Academy M60A1 to backdate it to this vehicle that we have here. Now, although that set is a, again, a viable option and was really your best bet for the longest period of time, the problem that you have going with that avenue is that first, you're going to be adding more to the kit's overall build, which is not necessarily an issue, but if you're a penny pincher, it's going to start chomping into your bottom line. On top of that, a lot of people do not have a whole lot of expertise and a lot of background when it comes to working with not just photo etch, but cast resin components. Because of these materials, you do need to have a special skill set in order to work with these parts that a lot of modelers just don't have. and tend to overlook. With this kit here being an all plastic traditional kit, it really one-ups the Legend set in my opinion, and if you're looking for a nice, quick, simple build of the original M60, you really don't need to look any more further than this kit that we have here. Now this plugs us directly into skill level and recommendation. Now, like I said before, this model being a traditional plastic model kit, that is made by a contemporary manufacturer, makes this a fantastic viable option for most of the builders out there on the market. However, I can't recommend this model to a beginner individual. 
The reason why I say that is because several of the model's components are finely molded and are finely detailed, and because of which a lot of care and expertise needs to be handled with them in order to assemble them appropriately without the need of pieces breaking and getting damaged. Because of this, this model here is best left for someone who has intermediate to advanced skill range. Something like this would be the type of model that you level up to from something, say, like the Academy or Tamiya M60A1. If an individual has already built one or both of those kits and you're looking for something else to springboard off of, this model here is a fantastic choice to jump into. As several of the details are very similar to the ones found on the Tamiya and the Academy one with the overall size, shape, and in many cases, the some of the construction methods, but on this model here, they're a lot more finer and a lot more frailer compared to the ones on the other releases. Because of that, if you've already built those other two, this guy here is definitely something that you could look into. Now for recommendations, obviously anybody who is a fan of the Patton or the M60 absolutely has to have one of these kits in their collection. There's no and if or buts about it. This kit here is a keystone in the M60's family tree, and if you don't have it in your collection, frankly, you're not a patent fan. I'm just going to come out and say it. On top of that, anybody who's a fan of post-World War II or Cold War era armor, this model here definitely has a nice place in that type of a collection. Another individual who would appreciate this build would be anybody who's a fan of American military vehicles or just American armor in general. And with that, that wraps up this model showcase video for this 135th scale M60 main battle tank. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posted content, be it model showcase videos like this guy over here, or the larger scale project update videos when they frequently get posted. Another way to keep in the loop of new posted content is by liking us on Facebook. There, I have more photographs of this particular model, as well as the other smaller and larger scale builds that have been showcased on the ECA channel in the past. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by EastCoastArmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detailed components. Thanks for watching.